Okay, it's 12.30, so I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome everybody to First Friday with Bridget Mullane. I'm Julia Silas, I'm the Program Director at Writing New South Wales. Before we start, I'd just like to go over some technical aspects of today's chat. You'll be unmuted, you'll be muted for the whole event to ensure the best sound quality. Let us know in the chat if you're having any uh, trouble hearing our speakers or having any technical issues and we'll do our best to help. Um, when in doubt, the best option is to exit the Zoom meeting and then uh, rejoin from the link in your email. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, we invite you to do that via the chat. We'll take as many questions, uh, as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A at the end of the event. Please feel free to chat with your fellow attendees throughout. We're recording the event, so if you do drop out or have to leave early, you can always watch it later on our website. So I'd like to start the event by acknowledging the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands Writing New South Wales is situated and from where I'm joining you today. I pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from where you're joining us from today. And please feel free to make your own acknowledgement of country in the chat box if you'd like to do that. So now I welcome Bridget Mullane. Uh, Bridget is commissioning editor at Ultimo Press. Uh, she previously worked at Hachette where she was the managing editor. Before that, she was the editor of literary journal Kill Your Darlings, communications manager at Writers Victoria, and she's also worked at a variety of roles at Melbourne Writers Festival, National Young Writers Festival, Emerging Writers Festival, The Sun Bookshop and uh, Brunswick Street Bookstore. Welcome, Bridget. It's lovely to have you join us today. Thanks, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Um, so it's clear from your bio that you've had a very interesting career that pretty much covers the whole breadth of the publishing landscape, from bookstores to journals, writers' centres, festivals and small and large publishers. We'll, we'll, of course, focus on your role at Ultima Press, but in the lead up to that, I just wanted to talk about your career trajectory because I think it covers many of the important stages of a writer's journal journey. I mean, you've, you sort of have the perfect, <laughs> perfect you know, leaping from one, one stage to the next. Um, so you started working in bookstores, which for many readers and writers is a very special and happy place. Um, what did you learn about the publishing industry from working in a bookstore? I, I think it's the perfect place to start in terms of thinking about publishing and editing and reading. So I was really lucky to um, get jobs in independence, especially. I did also work at Borders, but I tend to leave that off because I think that was a little less informative in terms of, um, especially in Melbourne, the independent bookstores are so connected to their community and their readers. And so I really did get a sense of books and their readers and books interacting with people rather than just as a kind of pristine intellectual property, this, this mm -hmm. thing that people really connect with. Um, so I think that was a great place to start. It also exposed me to heaps of genres that I had never before been interested in. I remember, you know, reading Fifty Shades of Grey, reading all these books that potentially I wouldn't have done if I didn't, you know, but I just felt like I had to know what was going on in each kind of corner of the, of the bookstore. Mm. Um, especially the sun in Yarraville. I think if anyone is near there or uh, is visiting Melbourne, it's such a special place. Um, Deb Force, who runs that store, just knows her, her customers and her community inside out. So it was a great, a great place to learn about what readers actually want, which sometimes can be a little different from what publishers think readers want. <laughs> a very important distinction. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, very useful feedback as someone working in publishing to, to always keep your eye on what readers want. <laughs> um, so you've also worked at several 
festivals, including the Melbourne Writers' Festival, Emerging Writers' Festival, National Young Writers' Festival. So particularly in light of the disruptions due to COVID over the last couple of years, what, what, what do you think is important about festivals? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because, again, I think it is this moment where the, the barriers between readers and authors are really broken down. So mm -hmm. there is this opportunity for authors to speak directly to their readers without anybody in the way. Readers can kind of engage with the work and with people they've admired without, without so many things in between. Um, mm -hmm. It's also just an incredible moment, I think, to celebrate the work that goes in to writing a book, which is huge, um, and then also publishing a book or selling a book, like all of these little steps along the way where people are um, touching the, the, the book and, and getting it to this place. You know, it's the culmination of many years of work, especially on the writer's, writer's side. So to have a moment to sort of stop and celebrate that, I think, is really important. Mm. Um, and I and I and I missed it a little bit. <laughs> you know, I I missed it. And and to to have been able to go to, you know, Sydney Writers Festival in person a little bit last year, and then again, bits and pieces this year was really was really special. I think. Mm. It was joyous. Mm. Because, I mean, it, it was fab, it was fabulous the way Melbourne Writers Festival in particular was able to pivot to being online. But there was something, I think, especially about this uh, 2022 Sydney Writers Festival. It was just the joy of seeing your colleagues and seeing writers and, and just being in amongst that milieu mm. of other people who are excited about books and reading. I think you can get in the weeds sometimes when you work in publishing. Um, and you forget to zoom out and think about the bigger picture of what it's really about. And a festival is just a moment where you go, wow, like this is, this is why you do it. This is the whole, the whole purpose. And you don't just get stuck in like the emails or the production schedule or all the things that have to happen to get there. But it's a nice moment to zoom out, I think. Yes. Yes, and thank heavens we've been able to return to doing that in person <laughs> again. Um, so at Writers Victoria, you worked as the communications manager, and I know this is a slightly loaded question coming from, <laughs> from me, but uh, what, what role do you think writer centres play in the literary landscape? I think you've... Sorry, I okay. hang on one second. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, it just froze for a minute. Yeah, there. I just lost everything for a minute there and my soul left my body. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't so terrifying. <laughs> yeah, so many warnings flashed. It was, okay, wait, okay, good. I You're... remained calm under pressure. <laughs> You did. We all saw it. <laughs> Sorry, Julia, I missed the question. Of course you did, because you were not here. <laughs> so I was just asking about um, when you were at, you know, your time you spent at Writers Victoria as a communications manager and uh, what you think is, what role do you think writer centres play in the, in the literary landscape? And I fully acknowledge that, you know, you're, you're not really in a much of a position to say anything bad given... <laughs> <laughs> Not that I would. <laughs> Not, Not that, that I would. would. <laughs> um, I think there's a few things that are really, well, for me personally, I think what it did is instill a respect for the work that goes into a manuscript. I think mm -hmm. um, not every manuscript is going to be published. That's kind of the reality of, you know, any kind of industry. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a respect for the time that people have taken to create these manuscripts mm -hmm. and, and work on them. Um, so I think that was really important uh, because sometimes when you're uh, dealing with, you know, hundreds or thousands of the end product, it can be easy to forget that even though it's a lot of work on that end, it was a lot more work on the other end mm -hmm. um, for each person. I also think the importance of 
doing things outside of the publishing industry potentially first is really important. So things like writers groups or courses, or so not necessarily being totally focused on the end goal of publication at the first port of call. So sort of mm -hmm. using writer centers to skill up or to meet your peers or to find people to give you feedback. I think that's a really important, important role that mm -hmm. they play. Um, yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what I took from that. I also just had a great experience working in writer centers with um, great people and then really engaged we had really engaged volunteers and really engaged um, authors and writers so that was just kind of a joy as well mm -hmm. and I mean it's interesting that you like talking about the amount of work that goes into a manuscript before it ever even gets to the stage of potentially being published um, I think and you know your your role as an editor at Kill Your Darlings um, is another place where that important work takes place for, for a writer's perspective, that it might be the first time they've ever worked with an editor or had, you know, had their work edited the first time that they've been published. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about how, how you see uh, literary journals and, the, and where and their place in that sort of development of a writer in the stages of publishing? Yeah, well, I think, again, it's a really important training ground in terms of having pieces of your work edited and what that process is like. Mm -hmm. You know, you go through, um, especially for a, a print journal, you go through all the stages that you would go through with a book. You know, mm -hmm. you... You might do a structural edit, you'll do a copy edit, you respond to the, like, sorry, they'll do a copy edit, you'll respond to the copy edit, mm -hmm. your piece will be typeset, it will be proofread, you respond to the proofread, like, it's everything that happens when you publish a manuscript, but on a smaller, on a smaller scale. Um, and I think learning how to be edited is really important. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very much part of the process of having a book published, nothing ever comes in perfect even the best writers go through all of those stages again structural sometimes developmental structural copy edit proofread mm. you know like mm. nothing comes through and just goes straight through to the keeper <laughs> so it's good to learn how to engage with editors and take feedback and mm. um, engage with ideas and learn to change things or learn to look at your piece a different way mm. I think it's also it's important in terms of um visibility as a as an author and as a writer people do notice um they do look in those places for new talent so kill your darlings um anthologies prizes i know that agents and editor commissioning editors and publishers look there when they're looking mm -hmm. for new work so you know there's nothing better than having a a piece on Kill Your Darlings and having a line that says, you know, da 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 is working on a novel. I know mm -hmm. it seems small, but mm -hmm. that might prompt someone who's read that piece who's in a commissioning role to reach out to you. And I've definitely reached out to quite a few people that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's that side of it as well, because working on a manuscript is such a big job. But sometimes if it comes through in a vacuum, and there's nothing else. There's nothing else that shows your craft except for that one thing. It can be quite hard to contextualize the mm. the the the, lot, the book length manuscript, if that makes sense. Mm, mm. Whereas if you've got little pieces around, mm. it kind of helps show your personality or show what you're trying to achieve as a as a writer. Mm. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it like that because, you know, I think it's very much a place where I, I know that editors and, and publishers and agents read journals to find people. But I think to that point that it's not just that they may find that piece, but that if they do come across something else that they can see the broader um, sphere of your work and and. And because not everything, you're, you're, you'll not be writing the same thing all the time. You'll be working on different things that give uh, highlight to other aspects of your skills. 
Yeah, it's a very good point. So um, in 2018, you made the move to Sydney and started working at Hachette, a highly respected major publishing house. You progressed there as well from senior editor to major to managing editor. So then, you know, given that's a pretty great place to be working, what, what compelled you to take the risk to move to Ultimo Press, a small, a new small independent publisher? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so firstly, just, I guess, point out that my very varied Melbourne career was by necessity, not design, because I was desperately trying to get into any publishing house that would have me. And it's very, very um, competitive. And there's lots of independents down there, which are small. Mm. Um, so the sort of, you know, come to Sydney, the big city, and there's bigger houses. And so there's sort of more opportunity. So I was really lucky to get a mat leave cover at Hachette then turned into a managing editor position and I learned a lot while I was there it's incredible um like a managing editor role is really good for getting scope across all acquisitions and production and all and all sorts of things um but in terms of making the move to Ultimo just the opportunity to start things comes mm. around so rarely mm. Mm. and I had a theory in my head and had sort of carried it for quite a while that Australian readers were being a little bit um, underestimated and underserved and that books were sometimes not being given as much editorial care mm -hmm. as they should. And I thought that better books would sell better. I thought, you know, I, I really thought that you know rushed books didn't seem to work well and I believe that good books work better and I wanted to test out the theory that you know <laughs> it seems very simple and everyone's obviously striving for the best quality all of the time but something about uh, starting a new press helping to set up the culture and putting at the forefront of the culture and of what makes the ultimate experience hopefully special is a really high editorial quality and like a rigorous um, process that isn't as tied to a, a, a budget line or, or, or a slot or a deadline. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just too good an opportunity to pass up. And I had a meeting with James Kello, who's the founder. And when you hear him speak, like it's very much the same thing, like he, really believes in quality books for readers and giving a chance to a sort of a, a, a group of writers that is a little bit underserved or missed I think which is um, especially from the bigger houses where you know there's sometimes a feeling that you need to sell a certain amount of copies to get a, a go and that necessarily means that sometimes you're looking backwards rather than forwards so if you're doing something interesting or exciting that hasn't been done before it's really hard to get a go mm. Um, mm. but I guess the Ultimo ethos is to do those <laughs> books to give those books a go mm. and to prove that they work by making them work mm. <laughs> rather than looking at what's worked before <laughs> and doing that again if that makes sense yeah. So t t talk a little bit more about the Ultimo ethos and, you know, what, what, what is the, what's special about Ultimo? Yeah, so it's, um, we've all come from large houses, uh, Penguin, Hachette, Pan Mac, um, and the idea is to sort of take the best lessons from that experience and put it with the heart of an independent, so kind of the... Mm the spirit of freedom and, sorry, I'm sounding very zealous, <laughs> Friday and I'm excited. Um, well, that says something in itself. Yes. So, so, so doing things that are maybe a bit different or challenging in another context um, or might seem small or very indie and putting the kind of thinking of a big house behind it. So not um, treating each book with care 
Mm. no matter what the expectation is for sales or making sure that everything's marketed and promoted, trying to do things interesting in that space as well. Um, and to build as well, build authors and sort of go back to um, something which I think has dropped off a little bit in Australian publishing where we've become very good at debuts. Mm. We like we like new, mm. we like fresh, we like one book and then we've sort of uh, dropped off from the support of a career and I think a lot of times um, authors take time to develop so mm. maybe book one and two are smaller and three is the one that is really the book that connects with readers but if you don't give people the opportunity after the debut you never get to the mm. to the third book and I mm. feel like Australian publishing knows how to do new um, but we didn't we're not as good as doing two or three. And and when you're saying when you're making that distinction, Australian publishing knows how to do new, do you think that it's different in the UK or America? Well yeah, I don't I actually don't know as much about the market over there. Um yeah, I don't know if I can speak to that because mm. I haven't definitely what what I pay attention to in the US is debuts. So I'm not sure what happens <laughs> with their second book. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm thinking about some of those authors like, um, you know, Christos Chalkis or people who've done so many, like it's, and it's really the support mm. of that career that means you can get to a place where you are Christos. But mm. no, I don't know about the US or UK. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So what sort of work is Ultimo looking to publish? Um, we've, we sort of say that there's nothing that isn't Ultimo if <laughs> but it's about how it's done, I guess. So um, currently we publish literary fiction, um, uh, crossover fiction or sort of sweet spot fiction. So reading group, um, we're doing a little bit of commercial fiction uh, and literary nonfiction, narrative nonfiction, memoir. We've, we've had some books with some illustrations so so it's sort of there isn't anything that we wouldn't do but those are the things we've done so far mm. uh, oh, except for children's and YA so right. yeah right but it, yeah maybe YA in the future but at the moment no mm. um, and is is Ultimo open for submissions we are so you can um, submit on our website um, there is a description of each of the publishers there. So you can have a look at what we're doing. And, and I think it's really good to think about who the right person is for, for mm -hmm. your manuscript. And we've tried to give as much information as possible there so that um, firstly, you can kind of hone what you submit. So we'll ask for a synopsis and an, an idea of what you think the book is doing or where it would sit mm. other authors that you think you might be like um my cat is gonna <laughs> descend upon me any second um uh and yeah and then we should be doing a big go through of that inbox from the last couple of months uh towards the end of this month so if you did want to submit anything now's a good time because we're going to be doing a big reading day coming up in a couple of weeks so oh, great. Yeah. and and if people are thinking about submitting what what ad, like what advice would you have for them to consider before submitting I would have a look at our website I think that it's clear what we're trying to do from our website so you can get a sense of if you think it, your book would fit into um, an Ultimo list mm -hmm because it is quite a small curated list. So I think anything you could do to be like, okay, my book would fit with Alex, the mm. publisher, and I can see that these are her other books and this is why I think that she would be the right person. I think that stuff's really helpful. Mm. Um, and, and I think that thinking around audience is really important as well for the author to do so that we have a we have the right idea about where you see your book and we can work out if the our visions align. So if mm -hmm. I read your manuscript and I think great, fabulously commercial um, reading group book and you think it's highly literary or 
diff- different. Like you want to find a publisher who sees things the way that you do. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. so thinking about authors that you're that you want your book to be considered wow. alongside, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, the same writing, mm-hmm. but, you know, similar themes or what they're trying to do. I think that's really important mm-hmm. to have a think about. Um, and then I, w- I would also just suggest it's n- not the first draft. Um, you know, I think it's good to to try rereading and revising things on your own before you submit. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that's hard because you've just finished a draft and you're exhausted <laughs> and you don't want to look at it anymore. But um, <laughs> you want to, I guess, put your best foot forward in, in the manuscript as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as you mentioned before, that's the benefit of, say, submitting a, a short piece or an extract to a journal so that you you get to have some of that development work done before you're ready to submit it to a publisher, which is a big step. Hmm. And you don't you don't get much of an opportunity. I guess you think hmm. about it like a you know job application where um, you get one chance to make a first impression. I know it's a, an absolute cliche, but um, you want to make sure that you're just putting your best work in front of people. Mm. Not that you can't resubmit if you have redrafted. I don't think anyone um, is going to bemoan that, but, mm. you know, you just might as well start with your best work. I think. Mm. Yeah. Well, because if you, know, you don't want to have somebody in a position of thinking, oh, I've already seen that. Mm. You, you, you don't you you want to minimize the reasons for people to to pass over something <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah 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 so at Ultimo you're a commissioning editor um tell us about what that role entails and also how is it distinct from being a publisher or a, a managing editor and or an editor oh that's an interesting question I think probably for Ultimo it's slightly different than other houses because uh, we're a small team. So I'm also operating as the managing editor um, as well as a project editor. So we all sort of, you know, share uh, in terms of making sure that there's the best kind of editorial quality that publisher, there's a publisher and a project editor within Ultimo that work on every book. And then there's also a freelance copy editor and proofreader that work on it. So we're sharing work you know, the publisher is the champion and then there's also someone else doing quality control. So um, generally a commissioning editor is someone who is seeking work to uh, commission. I think the distinguish, like uh, the distinction between publisher and commissioning editor is really just a, a hierarchy of kind of time mm. or an indication that you might be doing other things alongside your commissioning but I do all the work of a publisher for my books. So that's um, developmental and structural editing, uh, cover design, liaising with the marketing and publicity team around those plans, talking to the sales team about um, what bookstores the book should be in. So for my titles, I'm doing all of that. But I think the commissioning editor title also shows that I'm doing project editing for other people's books as well so it's kind of very varied right um, but but you are also commission you're looking for work that you want to publish and yes. have the have the um uh, ability to commission work yes yeah. yeah absolutely so I'm looking for my list at the moment um I initially started wanting narrative and literary nonfiction, but I think that COVID's been really hard for research nonfiction in particular because mm. no one has been able to go anywhere. Libraries have been closed. Mm. Um, so I'm working with quite a few authors in that space, but the process is a lot longer because um, when you submit a nonfiction manuscript as well, you often only need to have the pitch or the first three chapters. So not only are they writing the manuscript, um, they're also researching it. Whereas with fiction, um, that's almost always a full manuscript that's yeah. submitted. It's very rare that you buy something, a, a fiction manuscript that's not finished. Mm-hmm. 
So my initial idea was to come in and revolutionise Australian <laughs> narrative nonfiction, which I'm still working on. That's definitely still a project I'm, 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 I'm working on. Uh, but I'm also now just started commissioning fiction. So um, I'm really excited to be working with Sophie Cunningham, who people might know as founder of the Stella Prize or um, the author of Geography or City of Trees or mm. Melbourne. Mm. And I'm working with her on her first fiction book in 15 years, which is coming out in September called This oh. Devastating Fever, which has been amazing to oh. work with her <laughs> on. Um, and so I'm also looking out for fiction. I'm really interested in things that are trying to do something interesting with form or... Um, I'm quite interested in things with a gothic hook. Uh, also like psychological crime thriller. Like I, that's something I read for pleasure a lot. So I'd be really interested to see anything in that space as well. Um, so yeah, it, I'm, I'm building the list at the moment. So uh, this year I've got Sophie and then next year I've got sort of about six six books coming out but I've got room for more so um if anyone's writing in those genres feel free to to submit on the on the website um and where do you go so you know you're they're the things that you're interested in in where do you where do you look for new yeah. work well it, it's interesting being in a role like this where I'm new to the commissioning so there is a lot mm. of me going um on my own speed, if that makes sense. So I am really out there looking. Mm. Um, I go to literary journals. I look at people who've been shortlisted for things like the nonfiction prize. I, I, it's not a scribe nonfiction prize anymore. I think it's Deacon nonfiction prize. Mm. Um, I read the submissions inbox. I look at people who've written interesting articles that might have a hook that would be book length or podcasts that are interesting mm -hmm. um twitter sometimes <laughs> um if you can bear it <laughs> yes yeah I'm a, I'm a lurker not a, I don't have an account but I somehow managed to to lurk there regardless yeah. um so it is just looking at those those places where shorter form work is happening and mm -hmm. and um contacting people to see if they're interested in in, in longer form or if they've got something. Mm. So you, you mentioned prizes there. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about the prize that Ultimo has set up? Yeah, well, <laughs> so, so our first year, um, we... That's beautiful. Uh, hold, it up a, hold it up. Oh, I got, I, sorry. I, I turned off self-view, so I wasn't just staring oh. at myself. Oh. <laughs> so I have no idea what you guys are saying. Yeah, we can uh, so, see. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. So I contacted a lot of people out of this, which was our um, first anthology coming out of the Ultimo Prize, where people submitted poetry and short fiction. Um, and the first year we focused on young writers. So I, I reached out to a lot of them. We've just had the second year of the Ultimo Prize, which was in collaboration with Westward so that's just closed and that was for a full length manuscript so I think the idea with the prize is to vary vary the prizes parameters based on what we're looking for at the time so mm -hmm. when we started we really wanted some young emerging writers to see what was out there that people that might not have agents or um, might not know how to put get their foot in the door uh, and then it was nice to partner with Westward's for a longer manuscript and then so so next year we'll we'll do another prize uh, which will be based around what we're looking for that year so it's a bit of a movable feast mm. and that's um, very it's very unusual for a prize to not just be one thing to, to be uh, shifting and and changing yeah, how it operates well, we want to sort of we want it to suit um our purposes as well as authors i guess so it makes sense to if next year we want to find a memoir to make it a memoir prize. Mm. And I think there's lots of great um, unpublished manuscript prizes now, which I'm sure everyone here has seen, like the Rochelle Prize or the Banjo Prize. Um, everyone has one at the mm. moment, which is great because it's a really good way to get get your stuff read. Yeah. 
Um, but that just gave us the freedom to do something a little bit different because if we just did an unpublished manuscript prize, you know, we'll see the same thing that everyone else will see. So yeah. how do you find someone that that isn't there already, mm. if that makes mm. sense? Yeah. And, but also I think it reflects uh, one of the strengths of small publishers is that ability to change direction and do things differently and pivot. There's not this, this sort of weight behind... Uh, doing things in the way that you've done them because they've been successful not you know it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with that it's just it it is um yeah I think it is a strength of of a small organization that you can mix things up nimble <laughs> nimble and and be experimental take and take risks yeah you know there's a that's a a, a great strength so Moving out more broadly, um, what trends are you noticing in publishing at the moment? Oh, this is interesting. Um, I think, so I, I have a hunch about a trend, but I feel like it, we haven't quite hit it yet. Mm. Like I think, I think I'm picking up on a feeling amongst <laughs> publishers. This is all very technical, <laughs> the vibe of the thing. Um, but I feel like there's a real desire from commissioners and publishers to have books that are warm and in some ways uh, uplifting or fun or humorous. Um, I think that, you know, everyone in their own way has become very tired by the last couple of years and mm. the idea of sitting down to read something very serious and dark is not on the forefront of um, commissioners' minds or publishers' minds. I'm, mm. I don't, I'm, I'm obviously just making generalisations. I'm not sure if this is the case, <laughs> but I do think that um, if you think about uplit or, or things like that, like a fiction that has a heart and um, a plot that pulls you through and mm. it might not have a devastating ending, it might just be a journey I think people are really interested in that and I think that I've seen those kinds of books really get snapped up around mm. the place mm. um, I think we're moving a little bit away from um, sort of deep traumatic memoir I, I think that that again just might be a byproduct of the last couple of years where mm people aren't feeling like they want to read about really heavy issues. I think mm. that doesn't mean it's not going to come back around, but mm. I, I do think there is this kind of search for lightness and connection and um, books that have a feeling of hope or joy mm. or mm. just not frivolous, but just a lightness, if that mm. makes sense. Mm. Um I think and the, we're definitely because, all in need of this. Yeah. You know, that's sort of like a common feeling. of. Um, well, it's interesting as well if you think about crime and some of the books. Obviously, there's such great Australian crime writers and, you know, Jane Harper and Chris Hammer and mm. Christian White are still all doing incredibly well. Mm. And, and, but I don't consider them particularly like grisly crime books. But you see things coming out like um, we've got one from Solari Gentle, The Woman in the Library, which is kind of like cosy crime or Ben Stevenson's um, Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone. These oh, kind yeah. of like um, knives out -y sort of <laughs> Agatha Christie-like. Um, I think that demonstrates what maybe I'm trying to talk about where, where there's this just a little bit more lightness. It's not grisly. It's not. A bit more it's gentle a, yeah so um yeah I think I think that's an interesting indicator of what I'm trying to articulate mm, mm. it's very interesting and and it, it I mean I think it fits in I mean I'm not thinking of from a publishing perspective just from a personal you know what's going on in your life perspective that that is the what I, I think I you know, feel drawn to myself, you know, it's like that last couple of years have been hard and, uh, you know, 
at times bleak. <laughs> it's certainly not something that I feel like I want to be reading about. Mm. Um, yeah. So you, you, I mean, I, you've mentioned that you're working on Sophie Cunningham's book. Um, I suppose, you know, in addition to that, what are you working on now and what, what are you excited about working mm. on? Well, I'm very excited that um, the first book that I bought, which is Izzy, Isabel Oderberg's Hard to Bear, which is a book about pregnancy loss and miscarriage. She just delivered her manuscript to me last night. So I'm incredibly excited for that. She has been writing in this space for her entire journalistic career. Um, this is really a kind of clarion call to change the way that the medical establishment looks at at patients who experience pregnancy loss and mm. um you know I think about it as this kind of real opportunity to spark a conversation that could end up with real systematic change so I'm incredibly mm. excited that will be mm. coming out um early next year right so that is one of my career highlights already and I haven't even published it yet so I'm so <laughs> thrilled to be working with her I'm trying to think of what else has been announced that I can talk about oh yes I don't want to get you in trouble <laughs> yeah I don't think I've I don't think anything else has been announced yet but I have I have some great things coming up <laughs> in 2022 uh, a uh, kind of selection of both fiction and non-fiction um that I'm just incredibly privileged to be working with these writers on There's some um, very exciting stuff. Mm. So I've got one more question for you, and I and I can already see that we have a lot of questions from the audience. So I'll 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 just ask that one more question, and then we'll go to the audience questions. But um, it's a very broad question. What do you love about being an editor? Oh, I or about your job. Yes. Well, yeah, I think editing is what brought me mm. here. Mm. And what I love is authors and words, which is very simple. <laughs> um, but the two most important things about um, editing, I think, is authors and words. And what I love is about um, being able to help someone craft their writing to get out what is in here to somebody else like I think that's such a special mm. a special thing to be able to do um I love robust conversations around m dashes and semicolons I will you know um defend a spaced n dash to the ends of the earth but I am coming around to to an unspaced m dash I, I you know <laughs> You've got, to, you've got to be able to change. But I do think it's that like getting stuck into the work of the words that I find really special and being able to help someone craft their writing. I'm completely in awe of people who can write. Mm -hmm. I am a great reader mm -hmm. and I am really passionate about editing, but give me a blank page and I am absolutely stuffed. So I think, you know, the privilege of being able to work with people who um, are doing everything they can to communicate their ideas with readers is really special, I think. Mm. Well, thank heavens for people like you, because I think it's, you know, there's th that, that you love authors and words, and it's only through having the work done on the words that authors can reach their audience you know that that, that 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 the words need to capture what they're trying to say and then having someone to, with you to work with so that they're as crafted and expressive as they need to be so that it can truly land with the people who mm. those ideas want to be given to um, it's uh, very important that there's people like you <laughs> I think we're very Thank fortunate you. Maybe you're very special <laughs> well uh, you know it, it, it's a it's a it's a you know what you have to offer is a gift to the writer and to the readers you know so that there's great things to be read so we're going to go to the uh, questions from the audience so Bron asks um what is the process 
for allocating a book to a genre and how might you decide where it fits? Uh, that, I, mean, I think that's a great question, but she also says also what grabs you personally when you start to read a manuscript. But let's, let's stay with that first. Um, how do you allocate a book to a genre? Oh, that's, I think that's an interesting question. I, I guess we're, we're thinking about fiction in this mm, context. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's obviously tropes for every genre. So, um, you know, a crime book when there's a you know, detective and a dead body and a, <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and similar, like a psychological thriller, you can tell it by potentially the, the type of narrator or the type of um, crime or event that occurs. I think what's quite difficult is literary fiction. It's sort of a, you know, it's a bit of a catch-all term for things mm. that can't be uh, categorised in other ways. Mm. Um, and, of course, with a literary fiction book, you can have elements of crime or you could have elements of a, a, a dystopia or um, all sorts of things. Um, and I think, for me, that's the hardest one. That's mm. the hardest genre to, to define. I think and, that, oh, sorry, you go. Oh, oh, so how important do you think it is for writers to be, um, do you think a writer needs to be clear about what genre they're writing in? I think you have to think about it for sure. Like I think you have to, especially if you're wanting to write in a genre that has tropes and, you know, if you're writing a, a, a crime book, people read those books all the time you can subvert all the tropes you can you but you have to understand them yeah um so I do think it's important to know what your book is mm. um it might be genre bending it might be genre defying but I think you want to know the roots of what you're trying to do mm. and then it's easier to disrupt them once mm. you know the rules you can break them yeah um so I do think it, I do think that's important and I think it should come from the author more than the, the publisher we don't often do we don't often allocate a t you know a genre it mm. sort of comes with a genre mm. if that makes sense mm. yeah so the other part of Ron's question is um what grabs you personally when you start to read a manuscript mm. very it's a very unquantifiable <laughs> thing called voice you know I'm sure you like everyone's heard this before mm. but it really is um the voice of the book or the author or the protagonist. Um, I like things that are exciting but still accessible. So, you mm. know, super high, high, high literary is not necessarily for me. I, mm. I like things that are ambitious, but I can still read them. You know, mm. that's how, yeah. That's you don't right. have to work too hard to read them. Well, I just like things to be um, accessible. Uh, and then then I think you can challenge people in all sorts of other ways. Mm. Um, but for me, and lots of people are different, you know, that kind of really intricate uh, language for the sake of the beauty of the language mm. is something that I like to read outside of work. But I, I'm not as strong editorially on that on that mm. so I you know, mm. I'm not as interested in publishing it, I think. Mm. Mm. Um, I do like a plot. Again, that's like seems really basic, but not everything has a plot. Like some of those beautifully lyrical books are all about the experience, mm. and and you know I like a plot. Um, mm. a, a, a good strong synopsis as well. I know that is what grabs everyone, but I think it's really important if you are able to articulate what you're trying to achieve with your book. Um, I think that really gets my attention as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very important. Um, so Izzy asks, what are the most common reasons manuscripts are rejected? Hmm. Uh, I think the most common is probably not having a great synopsis. Mm. I, think, and I think that's kind of the architecture which helps us navigate a lot of submissions. So a good synopsis really does put you in good stead. Mm. Um, I also think the you want your first chapter to be the strongest. So even if you don't have time to redraft everything else, like work really hard on your opening because mm. a lot of these decisions are getting made um, 
you know, in a row of these decisions. So mm. you want that, you want a really kind of strong opening. Um, is there any, it's, it's, I don't think there's anything that, you know, blanket gets you kicked out of the mm. <laughs> submissions mm. inbox. Um, I think what's really helpful is, um, you know, a respect for the people on the other end. I know it's really frustrating when you're submitting a lot and potentially not hearing anything back. Um, but I think trying to maintain kind of a respectful interaction mm. is really is really helpful as well because a lot of wanting to work on someone's book is also wanting to work with them. Mm. And it's mm. a long process and you're working really closely. So you want to have a rapport personally as well as professionally mm. so that, you know, you can have tough conversations about the book and, and you want to spend that time together. Mm. So I think that's really, that's really helpful as well. I know that, I know it's sometimes really frustrating because yeah, a, yeah. But. Yeah. <laughs> Hard at both ends. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Judith asks, how central are literary agents in getting manuscripts looked at and published? Yeah, interesting question. I think that definitely uh, an agent is really helpful to get your manuscript look, looked at mm. um, because those relationships are already built um, and a publisher knows that there's already been a level of engagement with the work whether that's you know just someone with a knowledge of the industry and taste that you respect has decided that this book is worth representing so that is absolutely um, mm -hmm. a foot in the door it's not the only way I think at Ultimo it's probably about 50 50 agented to unagented books and would that be um would a, would other publishing houses have a different uh, ratio um, I think it has shed. It was probably about the same as well. All right. Maybe a little bit more on the agent side, but not, mm -hmm. but not hugely. Mm. Um, I, I think the agents in Australia are fantastic. And I think it is great to have a champion for your work who can talk about money stuff and contract stuff so that you don't have to. Mm. Um, but if you can't find representation, I wouldn't think that that's the end because there's mm. definitely a lot of other ways to get in mm. um, and get published but it mm. is nice to have two champions like a publisher and an agent and then if there's a problem they can fight it out and you can just <laughs> work on your writing and you don't have to think about anything at all so it's a good thing <laughs> yes so Aphrodite asks um, is Ultimo Press and publishing in general open to multilingual manuscripts? And, then, and she says, written in English, but also incorporating other languages and reflecting on multicultural stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. I think that sounds really interesting. Mm. Um, especially, you know, I think there's quite a few people who in everything all at once incorporated uh languages other than English without translation, which I think is a really interesting, it's, I think it's a really good um, way to challenge readers who anticipate English as the default. And mm. it kind of gets you in this, this, this other way of thinking. Mm. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're also not, um, we're also looking at things like translated works and um, so, so fully translated works from other, other languages to English as well. We just haven't sort of had one come through that we were interested enough to pursue. But no, that sounds really interesting. Mm, great. Um, so Jen says, with attention spans shorting, shortening, apparently, uh, is the future bright for the novella? Oh, I, this is a, I do not have an answer for this. This is a conversation <laughs> that I can tell you is happening in rooms around mm you know, publishing <laughs> houses everywhere. And, and a similar thing for short stories mm. as well. Mm. Um, I, it's, it's interesting because I do think that intellectually it feels like, yes, right? Short stories and, and novellas should be having a moment. Mm. So I'm not sure if it's 
the gatekeepers in publishing stopping that from happening because in the past novella and short stories have been notoriously hard mm. to mm. sell mm. um but then you look at something like uh Giramundo put out a fantastic book by Jessica Owl called Cold Enough for Snow, mm. which is just like stunning. Mm. And maybe, maybe 40,000 words, maybe 35,000 words. And it's done incredibly well. And people love it. Like I'm obsessed with it. Mm. Uh, but that won a prize. It won a novel prize. <laughs> so even, yeah. even something that you could argue was a novella yeah. um, won a novel prize, mm. which is how it, it was able to sort of find a place. Mm. Um, I think it's a really interesting thing to look into because we we are sort of fighting this battle against, this sounds very dramatic, but I'm always fighting a battle between my phone and a book, you know, between like mm. an instant dopamine hit of something on my phone mm. to something long form, which I know is better for me. And <laughs> more nourishing <laughs> yeah more nourishing in the long term and maybe short stories and novellas is the solution but we haven't quite seen that shift yet happen in real time mm. 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 yeah that's a very good question um so emma asks on the move to lightness and this may be too much of a ya question for you to answer is dystopian over for now and it's mm. from someone wanting to publish in this space Oh, look, after all my prattling on about um, lightness, I guess the flip side of that is that people are looking for a way to express um, climate anxiety and general anxiety about the world in literature and dystopia is such a great way to do that. Mm. Um, so I, I, I don't know a lot about YA, so I, I think it might be, there, there's probably much more educated people in that area to talk about it but I suspect that no I think that you've still got a market for dystopia because we want to have a way to think about the things that we're dealing with in real life with a little bit of the remove of fiction mm. and I think mm. that dystopia is great for that mm. um, and I think it, I'm I'm really interested to see how I mean like given that we've been living in a form of dystopia <laughs> um, and how that gets incorporated into fiction like, I'm, 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 I'm interested to see how that unfolds you should and... definitely all check out Sophie Cunningham's book this devastating fever coming out in <laughs> September which is funny and it has COVID in it and it has all these things that we've been dealing with but it has again like a a lightness and humor that means that you don't leave feeling like everything is horrible and the worst it kind of makes you feel a deep appreciation for the joy that you can still find or um sort of the messages in her book is the world has always been ending we've always felt every generation always feels like the world is ending and maybe it's ending more for us but how do you still find joy and satisfaction and um especially in in light of living a creative life so well September, I think you've just you, my press <laughs> everyone's well it just added that to their reading list you've done a brilliant job <laughs> pre-marketing is in full yes force. This, is, this is me building word, word of mouth buzz <laughs> yeah you heard it all here first <laughs> perfectly <laughs> um so just continuing the questions because there are a couple more uh Ella asks do you have any advice for people hoping to publish a collection of poetry as opposed to fiction or non-fiction manuscript uh, again this is an area that I I'm not mm. I'm not particularly au fait with um there are some great poetry publishers I think um Giramundo does a great job UQP does a great job mm. Rabbit um is a smaller press who also publishes poetry quite a few good prizes um overland has has won um so knowing a bit less about that that area i do think there's a similar kind of vein where um something like you know the ultimate prize would have been great or submitting to mianjin or mm. places that do publish poetry in a um literary journals and things like that i think helps you build a collection so that you can go to some of these publishers um, with your work. Mm, mm. 
Okay, quick question. Ray asks, should a fictionalised memoir, should I call a fictionalised memoir a memoir or a novel? Hmm. Very interesting. There's definitely, there's pluses and minuses to both. Mm. I think that generally publishers tend to, there's a few things that make an autofiction book a lot easier than a memoir. <laughs> some in term, like um, uh, any kind of legal concerns can be written away. There's a narrative structure that exists in fiction that might be harder in memoir. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that there's lots of great authors who publish sort of auto fiction, which allows them to have kind of a little bit of remove from, from this being exactly their story. Mm. Um, but I think I think it depends. It depends on the on the work. I really like memoir that uses uh, the style of fiction, if that makes sense. So not really straight nonfiction, but uses mm -hmm. kind of lyrical language or uses some of the tricks of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I I don't know in terms of submitting mm -hmm. what would be better. Sorry, I don't have mm. I don't have a proper answer, but there's a few things to think about in there. They're, they're, yeah, I think they're all really good, helpful things to think about, and they were great questions. I mean, thank you everybody for submitting such interesting questions. But I'm afraid that's all that we have time for today. Um, thank you, Bridget, for just for just a fantastic, uh, enlightening, interesting, engaging conversation. We really appreciate having you join us today. Uh, the next First Friday will be on Friday 1 July with Joanne Key, who's the executive producer of Riverside's National Theatre of Parramatta. That'll be a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you at another Writing New South Wales event soon. We really appreciate having you all with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, Bridget. <laughs> Thank you.